Hello everyone, welcome to Stoic Talks. Today we have with us Mr. Keshav Garg, the Director of Counter Cyclical Investments PMS. His expertise lies in spotting and investing in promising small cap and micro cap companies. His passion is in interacting with management, attending as many AGMs as he can, visiting plants, doing channel checks, and then making up an investment case. In this episode, we delve deeper into his investing style processes and how he picks this potential micro cap companies. So let's welcome Keshav here. So Keshav, uh, before we start on uh, in depth on investing and everything, let us know how did you get into the markets in the first place and how did it start out of? So Nuresh, I way back when I was in college in Ferguson in uh, around 2004, when I started reading Economic Times and those days with Economic Times, a supplement used to come in which all the stock prices were there and plus market cap and P ratio was given. And I think 52 week high low was also given. So I just uh, started having a look at that, that uh, what is this all about? And I remember I first read in Economic Times itself that has declared a dividend of 300%. So I was really uh, amazed that uh, isn't this great that you buy something and you get 300% dividend. So I had no clue that the dividend was on the face value. And since I was not uh, from a commerce background, so but that's what basically triggered my interest. And the first thing I remember was to understand the P ratio since it was mentioned in that ET uh, economic time supplement. So and I understood that uh, concept uh, that price to earning is, I mean, how many times the profits the company is trading at. So that was the first thing probably I understood. And for many years, that was the only thing I understood. And I had no clue about cyclically adjusted P. I just understood P. So whatever low P is there, that is, it is good. And high P is bad. That was my understanding for many, many years. And uh, gradually, and basically, so I used to, and since that period coincided with the huge bull market from 2004 to 2008, so I used to dabble in stocks uh, starting 2005 or thereabouts, and I used to apply in IPOs, and since during that time, all listings used to be like bumper listings. So I used to think that I am a genius and that I know everything and it is so easy to make money in this market. So how it went that in 2007, I was a total tech investor. So I had all the tech stocks and all fraud stocks, all, uh, I don't want to take names, but basically all of them are presently now penny stocks. But at that time, when I was buying these stocks, I used to think that this is the future that I'm buying and probably these stocks are the next. And uh, so I didn't um, used to, but I used to read about uh, economics and everything. Uh, But I really didn't know much about the stock markets. And only when the 2008 crash happened and uh, then since my portfolio was deep in red then i thought that uh, and and at that time i used to run a very concentrated portfolio of all these uh, uh, hanky panky tech stocks and uh, so when in 2008 the market crashed then my largest holding used to be this company came out with an ipo in 2007 and they raised 30 crores and uh, for purportedly for setting up a enzyme plant okay which was some 40 50 kilometers away from hyderabad so mm-hmm. i had put approximately half of my portfolio in this company itself so and all i knew about this company was it was setting up a enzyme plant and also that it was into bioinformatics and what is bioinformatics okay. that biotech plus it is bioinformatics so i thought that this is a great thing and the future belongs to this company so in 2008 when the stock crashed along with the market so i went to hyderabad where my friend was based and together we took his car and <laughs> went to genome valley and we were roaming around in the genome valley asking people that where is the enzyme plant 
so we couldn't find that plant till evening and in the evening our car met with an accident so <laughs> it was a total loss not only could we find the enzyme plant our car also got damaged so in any case so after the shock of 2008 9 then i started basically i read security analysis i read intelligent investor and i started reading annual reports i read warren buffett's letters to shareholders and since the beginning only my inclination was always towards fundamental investing so and that's how then uh, basically since i have never worked in any organization so it was all bottoms up trial and error so that's how i was since the beginning in the small cap end of the market and in 2009 once the market turned around i exited all my uh, katra stocks uh, which are now penny stocks and then i gradually i started buying high quality companies and high quality i won't say high quality companies i mean at least not companies trading at huge uh, basically cigar butt valuations so and then i started basically running a diversified portfolio then by a stroke of luck in 2011 uh, i came across this company and uh, myself and my friend we went to the agm and uh, the promoter was uh, there was hardly anybody in the agm so the promoter gave us time he explained us the business and basically the situation was that the stock was trading at some 4 5 times pe and it had got some 4% or there about dividend yield and uh, the growth was amazing uh, from that base and the promoter said that i am the largest synthetic uh, leather manufacturer in india and clients are queuing up uh, outside my office they want more supplies but i am not interested in expanding capacity and catering to the low quality domestic market i am trying to sell this in us to international auto oems at three times the realization so i mean it was very easy to understand that normally uh, selling is the hard part not manufacturing but you need to be able to sell as much as you are producing but here the situation was opposite that the customers wanted more but he was not interested in uh, just expanding capacity and uh, expanding sales of low realization products he wanted to enter the us market in which the realizations were triple so uh, that's uh, probably that was one of the few times i took a really big uh, bet and it was actually a no brainer uh, because at those valuations and after having met the promoter uh, so it was i think at peak was 45% of my portfolio and since then there has never been any stock which has come anywhere near close to that kind of uh, uh, concentration in my portfolio so basically i would still say that uh, it was my lucky break and that what uh, basically helped my basically build uh, help me build seed capital and i don't think although today relatively speaking today i know far more than what i knew in 2011 but uh, i have not got i still consider myself lucky but i have not got as lucky as to find anything like ever since uh, so uh, so you ended up being full time investing right away or you were doing something else also all through this period after studying so nurish i was originally i'm from a business uh, background business family and so job and everything was never in uh, an option so it was always that either i would do something on my own or i would join my uh, dad's business so uh yeah basically in 2008 9 was the time when the crash happened if i had to exit i would, i would have exited at that time and gone home so but since that did not happen so yeah because the weak hands in the bay market they throw in the towel and uh just leave the markets and those who stay back i think they stay back forever so that is the time you uh, became extremely devoted towards markets as a full time uh, vocation 
you would actually, say actually yeah, nurish i am always a one track mind only so i do only i have very few interests in life so whatever i have i just uh, even if i listen a good track uh, so or a good song so i just keep on listening to that until i am i am listening it to hundreds of time and that's when i'm done with it so i, I think uh, yeah so that's what it is Kesha, let's let's add a bit uh, timeline to this whole thing. So, two thousand eight nine, when you saw the crash, or when you were participating in that crash with the lab, you mentioned. So, at that time, this was um, during your college days, or you were already through with your college. Uh, just to add yeah, some time. Yeah, I, I had all all I had completed my college, and uh, I think I completed my college in two thousand six. Two thousand six graduation year. Uh, yeah. Now, two thousand seven, I was uh, busy with the bull market. I thought that what's the need to do anything? I'm anyway making money, and I had shares and so on. And yeah. And 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 since you mentioned that you are non-commerce background and you were making money in two thousand seven because of the bull market, probably uh, learning accounting was never in the top of your uh, you know of your agendas. So. when did you realize that you also need to probably build some understanding on accounts front and you know uh, or do you think it's important that important as people make it to it is it is very important and uh, the thing is that i since i did no formal commerce education so i read security analysis and i couldn't understand much of it and i read it uh, twice or thrice and intelligent investor i could e- easily understand that and uh, there after i just started reading annual reports and uh, in the beginning i didn't used to understand anything since i didn't even know what is inventory what is receivable but yeah if you just keep on doing something then it automatically you start understanding it and i think that's a far better way. i would not say far better i'm sure that people who have actually read commerce have done commerce they must be uh it must be far easier for them and i think that's the correct way to do it but uh, i don't think it's a roadblock as such i don't think that i don't think it is uh, a let's say a, a kind of a, let's say medical you cannot become a doctor yourself i mean you can become knowledgeable but i don't think you can uh, i mean how will you learn how to operate on your own and so on but i i don't think in stock market uh, it is uh, i mean that complex i mean basically all accounting and what i do i just stick with simple companies i like companies who have no subsidiaries i don't much like consolidated numbers actually it it becomes a leap of faith i mean if you look at conglomerates who have got engineering insurance and then they are making a consolidated balance sheet then i mean how much uh, it's it's really hard to find head and tail so i just uh, stick with simple businesses which i can understand and in since in any case we run a diversified portfolio so i don't like a company which has got 3 4 pages of notes to accounts and so on so simple company stand alone business is what i like but that would leave very very few companies nowadays no because uh, from what we have observed over a period of time companies have also you know hired irs and you know uh, even smaller companies and mid cap small cap names the annual report sizes have gone from some 30 40 pages to 200 pages uh, and and it has become a fashion to have you know good annual reports and jargon from warren buffett and so on and so forth this is in the annual reports itself so uh, let us i mean when you say you invest in simple business let's let's dwell down a bit more on your current style of picking stocks right so when you say uh, simple businesses one part is the business operations part which is simple but do you have some very quick uh, quick rejection criteria for example just like you said no subsidiaries or something like that no consolidated no, no, or look it's it's not an hard and it's not a hard and fast rule that there should be no subsidiary the thing is that if it is making sense and if it is a wholly owned subsidiary then uh, it's 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 not a deal breaker like many good companies if you see they have got wholly owned marketing subsidiaries abroad so that in the front end they have the a white man sitting over there which does uh, which basically deals with the customers 
and the back end they have outsourced the the the, the basically manufacturing is being done from india and all that makes sense uh companies have subsidiaries which have warehouses uh in uh foreign locations and so on but you see now what happens that in companies in which they have multiple subsidiaries in which uh they are not wholly owned okay so then what happens there might cash might be in some let's take example of i mean just for example sake we have no position over there so they have a major subsidiary in thailand in which they own 51% the parent company owns 51% so the most of the cash is in the foreign subsidiary right so if you look at the consolidated balance sheet they will include the full cash with the subsidiary even though they are holding 51% so uh, in the net worth they will subtract the minority interest but if you look at the consolidated cash balance and if you set it off with their uh, consolidated debt you will think that it's debt free now same is the case also but actually if you see the company is not debt free because company is including 100% of the cash of subsidiary whereas it owns only 51% similarly if you look at the operating cash flow statement the, the minority interest is not being subtracted so if you look at let's say a company like uh, which is not now it is trading at prima facie 10 times consolidated operating cash flow right but if you take out the the minor the all that cash flow does not belong to the parent company it belongs the the minority interest has not been subtracted and if you do that then the picture changes the stock is not as cheap as it looks so what i'm trying to say that i try to avoid these complications and i prefer companies which are simple like if a company unnecessarily has got multiple subsidiaries then i mean i take it as a negative sure uh, actually i mean when i said subsidiary that was just a point because you mentioned but my question was more towards do you have some strict criteria for not considering the company at the first place for example if this company has let's say high receivables i'm not interested in the company or something like that so is there a negative sort of checklist where these kind of companies i'm not interested in at all and then you start with the companies which are remaining is there something like that or you start yeah, so with so there is something like that so let's say bfsi i don't invest we do, i don't understand bfsi lending business anyway i'm not a big fan and uh, how do i know that okay today the books might be clean but tomorrow the bank might give some bad loan how would i come to know i will only come to know when that bad loan gets recognized and so on so basically lending business bfsi we don't touch gem gem jewelry we don't touch then uh, technology i think uh, it is beyond my they are far smarter people uh, from iits and so on who understand much more technology of a uh, newer generation uh, who have a edge because i am a old school person uh, so i i i don't want to play a game where the field is tilted against me so these are the sectors that we stay in more or less real estate also you can incl- include pure play real estate apart from that yeah i mean it depends upon case by case company to company the main thing is even if there is any let's say there is a issue of corporate governance that look corporate governance also very hard to define that i mean what magnitude of corporate governance is the whole business fraud like in the case of so on there is no business or is it that the business is real but the promoter doesn't want to share like there are many good companies in the market with strong businesses the only thing is that the promoter will not doesn't want the money to go out of the company he just wants to the business to grow but he doesn't want the money to go he will never do a share buyback no matter what the price of the share goes and the payout ratio will always remain uh, low so if the company becomes debt free he will diversify into something but he'll not pay out so whenever that kind of a company is there so we take it there are two ways how we uh, basically adjust firstly is the valuation so is the valuation low enough to basically uh, compensate for low uh, dividend payout and second thing is the allocation that we will make in that company will always be low so it will never become a major position 
so that's how we basically if the is the uh, is it whatever the negative is is it factored in the stock price uh, if it is then we are happy to take a small position but we will never take a large position in such companies in which the promoter either doesn't have the heart to give a uh, to make a big payout or will never do a share buyback and there are many such companies in the market can you can you put a number to that when you say low allocation what do you mean by in the portfolio context i mean it's look we have over 100 companies in our portfolio so that means median position would be like let's say 1% so you can say point something percent it also depends upon what kind of uh, valuation the company is trading at what are the triggers if there is some near term trigger if we think that earnings have bottomed out so then we can uh, maybe take a slightly larger position but it will never become like a uh, let's say top 5 for a, a significant allocation actually 100 companies is surprisingly large number matlab <laughs> uh, from somebody who manages professional money i i've rarely talked to anybody who has 100 companies in in portfolio but anyway we'll come to portfolio construction and allocation later on nuresh carry on with the question you had something yeah so it's interesting to see that in your website also you've clearly mentioned no bfsi no real estate so you've mentioned a lot of nos and say uh, going back to the point of 2011 so is it that say from the time of or that uh, debacle in uh, the 2007 you've been uh, uh, going attending agms all through the last many years and that has been one of your strategies that is how we met also so say that was 2011 so what was the next 10 12 years as in how did you uh, shape up differently in those years actually from 2009 onwards only i started attending as many agms i could any good company i used to come across i used to buy one share and then i used to go through the annual report try to attend the agm i think in 2018 19 i in during the last 15 days of september except for weekends i didn't uh, sleep in one city for two nights so i was traveling because most of the agms uh, were uh, bunched up so uh, i travel a lot i mean i used to pre covid uh, and try to attend as many agms as possible i think uh, even post covid we are if anything attending more agms but then the productivity per agm i mean uh, in a physical agm is far more uh, i mean if you go to a company in rajkot and you are the only person who has come from 20 years so the promoter also thinks that someone has taken the pain to come all the way from pune and if he has done his homework if he is asking some reasonable questions then they also don't mind uh, sharing information or describing their business or what they think about it and so on so basically that helps definitely especially in the small cap side of the market so if i mean after attending a agm since you go there and ask whatever apprehensions uh, Or, or basically potential red flags are there you want to know the perspective of the management so after that either you can just take that company strike it off that okay this company i'll not waste my time on this company now or then you can if it's a good company even if the valuations are unattractive at that point of time i keep on tracking that company and sometime in the future maybe years later whenever i can find that company at a attractive enough valuation when the business is going through a temporary down cycle that is the time when we buy actually keshav it's a very interesting point you made and i'll probably dwell a bit on bit more on that uh has there been cases where you found the initial study of company to be very attractive let's say the numbers and the financials were all looking good but post agm attendance or post meeting the management you changed your mind entirely uh i mean basically the idea the, time, the promoter uh, can have plans if if the promoter says that i want to uh, acquire something i go to the agm and ask for a share buyback and if the promoter says that i want to diversify into ev i will sell the stock okay so but you acha okay you would have already bought the company and then at a small tracking position and then you probably sell it after if you're not convinced with the plans is that what you're saying 
mostly it's it's due to capital allocation if the promoter wants to like now battery ev is the new craze just like 10 years 12 years back power was the craze every tom and dick and harry was getting into power now everybody is getting into ev and battery so i mean so if basically we think that the i want to buy companies in which the promoter is doing share buy so because that 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 is the litmus test for me that firstly the business is generating that kind of cash otherwise your bankers won't let you do do a share buy so firstly the business should be generating that kind of cash flow secondly the promoter should be having that heart that he is ready to distribute that kind of money so now if you look at again it's not a recommendation but i'm just trying to cite this example that since company has done five share buybacks and since the past two years they are doing open market buyback and he is distributing 10% of his net worth to minority shareholders and his uh, shareholding is only increasing so now there are so many companies well known companies that don't have 10% dividend payout ratio so from their profit they cannot pay 10% and here 10% of net worth he is paying out so i would definitely give some weightage to that and i don't know what this in this all the conference call and everything there are so many companies in which the people are totally obsessed ki they are uh, getting into intricacies that what uh, is this bifurcation wahan se kya aa raha hai wahan se kya yeah when the what what will you do with the profit if it's not going to come to you so since m- most of the people who attend com calls and all they are just doing their job they have been told ki go and attend that call so that's why he is and that's why you will never hear people asking for share buyback or increasing dividend they just want to know ki kya margin hone wala hai aur kya volume hone wala hai and so on and so forth i mean but what's that i mean agar what will you do with that if that money is not coming to you ultimately so keshav actually the point you're making is pretty valid and i've also seen over a period of time a lot of change has happened in the way this information which you're seeking from from the promoters uh, have you seen in your experience since you've been doing this from 2011 onwards from time attending agms and all uh, earlier attending agm pretty much was very important to get this kind of information but with time these information about companies plans what the management wants to do with the cash or you know uh, uh, plans for any other asset which is lying on uh, idle assets is more available more public in, i mean information is available in forums a lot of people do uh, i mean as you said con calls is now something which many companies do so have you seen agm's relevance going down over a period of time uh, in your experience or something else you get from agms which you otherwise can't get at all from other sources like con calls so the companies that do con calls i uh, don't uh, want to attend their agm until i want to uh, ask for a buyback and so on but mostly uh, if the company is already doing con call then why waste time in the agm so uh, that is there of course but mostly what in agm the benefit is that if i have attended some agms like many companies agms i have attended like maybe 10 times in the past 15 years so whatever the promoter told me that this is going to happen how much of it happened subsequently so basically if you listen to a management for the first time then you have to take him at face value i mean okay you can look at the past figures and then in that context you can try to see whether what he is saying has it done in the has he done it in the past or he is just talking out of his hat but still the point is that but if you have met someone in the past so you know that this guy kon kitna bolta hai some people are just boastful some people are just overtly optimistic and some people they just tell jaisa hai they call a spade a spade there are very tiny company in, based in coimbatore in which i just uh, i had bought this stock at 90 rupees then this stock went to 240 and i sold it and then again the results uh, bad results started coming out and again the stock fell below 90 
so i thought that uh, the company is good i have already met the promoter and i have seen the plant and everything so maybe it's a cyclical downturn and company will be fine so what happened that uh, incidentally there was a egm for name change of that company so i went to that egm and the promoter i asked him that sir what is happening uh, so he said that five new fully automated plants for 200 crore each have come up in china so i have had to slash my prices by 20% so my business is as good as finished so he told me in as many words so now they are most promoters will never say this they will just say nahi nahi hum to kar rahe chesta kar rahe hoga they will never say this they will not even tell you that they have reduced their prices by 20% so now this kind of management who tells upfront the negative news and uh, so that i give weightage so whenever in future if he gives a upbeat guidance i i will take it at face value because i know that from past experience that i mean there are so many people they only talk good ki sab achhi baat karenge otherwise they'll stop doing com call or they'll stop whatever even in the agm they'll not answer much so how many agms do you attend in a uh, general year I think post uh, uh, COVID online AGM there is no count of AGMs. I think in last day of September I must have be attending ten AGMs. How because many AGMs are going on simultaneously, so I open them. And if in one AGM some speech is some shareholder is making speech or some introduction is going on, so I mute it and. but actually it works uh, like in the first covid year 2020 i just heard for 2 minutes call in which the promoter just said that this is the best year in team industry in my 25 years so rest i didn't hear anything in that agm but that take away was enough to know that this year is going to be good for the tea industry so i mean it it you see maybe out of 10 agms you attend maybe in one or two you will find something uh, worthwhile and others are just a uh, effort that you put so pre covid how many agms would you generally attend uh, physically uh, physically let's say maybe some 60 70 something like that Hi friends i hope you are enjoying this particular episode i just want to take a minute and thanks the sponsors for this episode toy talks was built on a premise of actionable insights and detailed questioning and that usually requires the independence of doing that work when you're looking for somebody to partner with you are not only looking for somebody who will share your ethos but also will promote this independence of asking fearless questions without any hesitations so when we were looking for someone like that obvious first choice for me was a dsp mutual fund i have known their team i have worked with them for a long period of time you know they have this uh, tagline called hashtag invest for good which i really like because it really associates which in my observation i have seen them living this as the way of their life and which is very visible if you if you follow their work uh, in public they have done some excellent research efforts they've come up with some amazing reports which everybody enjoys reading for example they have this report called netra uh, then there is the transcript which talks about the concord transcripts then there is the annual report nectar the navigator and and many such reports which i enjoy reading and is enjoyed by many practitioners in the investment community so we are extremely proud to be working with such a team they completely agree with our vision for stoic talks and i really want to thank them for supporting this particular episode and if you aren't already i would highly recommend you to uh, follow them on twitter with their twitter id is at the rate dspmf so thanks once again and enjoy listening this show okay so let's uh, let's now dwell down a bit into your portfolio management style uh, you manage a portfolio for for uh, for uh, clients and uh, in your portfolio you keep a lot of companies as you said uh, is that for for that portfolio also you're talking about when you say 100 odd companies it's a fair yeah, to assume yeah, that yeah i'm talking about our pms the consolidated sure. portfolio 
so uh, before we start that when did you start managing other people's money uh, say roughly because the data online available is for the last 3 years but when did you start say even friends and family or you were on your own money only for the long period of time yeah so basically around 2010 i took over even before that i had a small portfolio but around 2010 i took over my dad's mutual fund portfolio of around 2 crores and i liquidated it and i started actively managing it and uh, around 2018 i thought actually 24 uh, 2014 to 2018 was my golden period when basically my portfolio went from around less than 4 crore in november 2013 to 55 crore in january 2018 so uh, that is the time when i thought that we can really i mean again over confidence came and i thought that uh, we can i can easily handle other people's money i just need to buy the same shares since i was anyway doing research for my family portfolio so yeah actually there was a huge bubble in small caps in 2017 so i knew that there was a bubble but uh, i just what i did i just uh, since i was always covering a lot of companies so from 2014 to 18 since there was a huge small cap bull run so i could sell what i had and i could buy other stocks and then i could sell those and uh, switch on to something else and finally when everything was expensive i was stuck with all the kachra companies because at the top of the market only crap is cheap and that's what i finally uh, bought so yeah so basically to answer a question in 2018 i decided that we can convert this into a pms since my own family portfolio was also significant uh, that i thought uh, it it would justify the expenses of a pms and so on so yeah that's when we uh, started the procedure and we launched in july of 2019 got it got it so um yeah so so coming to that uh, operational part of your pms given the fact that you have close to 100 odd companies in your portfolio so it's a pretty diversified first let me actually take a reverse path instead of going to stocks let me first understand the allocation uh what would be you know let's say top 5 companies or top 10 companies allocation just uh, to get an idea of how how spread how thinly or how thickly you are spread top 5 would be approximately 30% 30 to 35% 30% okay okay and and no so is it uh, is it fair to say that uh, close to 80 odd companies or maybe 80 85 companies will be very very small in terms of your allocation percentage wise less less than I a mean, percent maybe the the it is dynamic the smallest position can ultimately become the largest position also and vice versa yeah, sure sure so, no, so i mean at that, any given point in time given that you have large companies and top 5 takes 30% so it's it's fair to assume that a large set of companies will be very very slow very very low allocations touching less than a percentage or so on so forth right yes yes that is very true uh, some of it is due to that firstly we don't follow any model portfolio so we buy whatever is the best opportunity at that point of time when the we have uh, funds available second thing is that since there is no lower limit that below which we will not go in terms of market cap if the company is fitting our criteria in terms of corporate governance valuation business quality and so on so now what happens that if i am uh, buying something and if the stock goes up so what many people will do especially those who follow model portfolio either they will totally sell and exit that stock or then they will continue to buy at higher prices and if you are buying at higher prices then you have to uh, basically uh, come to terms with basically uh, accepting lower returns so what we do we stop buying if 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 something i'm i'm not talking about the price i'm talking about the valuation so if i'm buying something and if the stock goes up dramatically like let's say from march until today many stocks have doubled so now what i might do if i was buying 1000 shares i might be buying 250 shares now if at all i'm buying now uh, second thing is that 
since these micro caps liquidity is a big issue and if i continue to buy them my own buying will drive them up so that is another reason that i don't chase the stocks and since we spread our net very wide so they are always companies that of similar quality and uh, now cheaper valuation because now that the stock that i was earlier buying has gone up so there are other companies which are of similar quality and now which are of lower valuations so so we will uh, basically start buying those so that's why the portfolio gets diversified so we don't mind even if a stock has got 0.1% allocation i will not just sell it uh if i don't think that uh i'm getting good value for the stock i'm happy to hold 0.1% uh so actually yeah so the way i'm the, what i'm what i'm interpreting from you is that uh you don't have an allocation in mind when you're going for buying there is a company you like if you have some cash lying around or you're selling something you will probably end up buying this company with whatever amount you have in your portfolios it doesn't matter if it means 0.1% or 1% because you like the company uh, uh that's okay that's understandable uh first actually i have one question which is bugging me for long is this do you really find 100 companies with good corporate governance or you or a large chunk of those companies are actually in the lower segment which not many people are looking at i mean what is your hunting ground from what i'm hearing i I'm, i can guess that you're not too much into the f- most followed large cap big names but primarily towards the small cap micro cap names because if you want to do that kind of buying which you're saying that is the only uh, only only space where you'll find it is that a fair understanding or do you want to add something to this no that's a fair understanding the only thing is that i like companies which are thinly traded so because especially always one should be beware of highly liquid small caps that it's a small company and yet there is so much investor interest and if there is if there are such huge volumes then i mean there is such huge market participation then what is the value that people are still not able to see despite those huge volumes so it it doesn't really make and then high volumes and operator driven stocks they are all similar characteristic i mean every operator driven stock has to be high volume right so low volume you see what is the characteristic of a efficient market one of the characteristic is that it should be highly liquid so the reverse also holds true that if a stock is ill liquid then maybe it is inefficiently priced not necessarily so but basically at least it shows that there is lack of investor interest and now there are many companies that i'm st- tracking since 10 years and uh, they they never kabhi bhi volumes nahi hote us so i like those kind of companies that firstly promoter has doesn't is not interested in his stock there are no con calls wo there is no fancy annual report with all that jargon and uh, so i know that there is no operator that is uh, driving this stock and the promoter is also not interested in his stock price so i like such companies and uh, so b- but then the flip side is that i mean either you chase up the stock price or i just want i just sit as a best buyer every day and i wait if a desperate seller comes and gives his shares to me i am very happy otherwise so so it does not matter that even if i have a very minuscule position maybe over of ta- over a period of time i'll be able to scale up that position so to begin with it might be a insignificant uh, position so uh, say uh, from whatever we've discussed the uh, type of companies you actually are looking at people have never heard about also you've seen that happen in a, a lot of small companies which you participate and a few years down the line they get known right so uh, say one example is a company because it's in the public forum which you've spoken about you spoke about a couple of years or one and a half years back uh, in a forum and now there are qips there is investor interest right so uh, can you give us some examples wherein you suddenly lapped up so there was older example so there is no compliance risk ke where you suddenly landed up on a superb opportunity just out of nowhere yes yeah, so if you take the only so i go through all the quarterly results uh, as much as is humanly possible so i am 
currently stuck on 25th uh, may so till 25th i have covered all the results and rest i am still to do so if every 3 months i am looking at the numbers of all these companies since years so basically a pattern emerges on its own and as far as i was concerned so first time i opened the results and on the left hand side i saw the list of uh, of their stores in bihar so since i am originally from rachi uh, which is the capital of jharkhand which earlier was a part of bihar and many people in rachi have got connections in bihar so and i knew that in retail what kind of valuations are there in the market so i once i saw that this a retailing company so i called up people whom i knew in bihar and everybody said that yeah they not not only do they know about this they have shopped over there and they think it is doing brisk business so actually i called up many people in rachi and i asked them to uh, figure out from those in let's say from siwan from darbanga and such gaya uh, small places in bihar uh, with their contacts so and everybody uh, gave good uh, reviews so then next time when i uh, went to rachi then i just uh, took a, i traveled uh, to a few stores in bihar and just from outside only you can make out whether this place is doing business it's humming with activity or is it just deserted so yeah so i could uh, figure that out that the business is genuine and stores are for real and they were doing biz- good business and at that market cap it was like a no brainer so yeah so okay so uh, actually it's it's getting more interesting from the vantage point of uh, the more i think about this uh, managing a portfolio the way you do you are by default not chasing the price as you rightly said you have to look at the value and if you're comfortable with value you buy and sit right now when you buy and sit there is always a risk of the company not finding its value for some time you can you can sit at the similar price level for a long period of time uh and if that is the risk in the portfolio i mean sure it's not a risk from your vantage point but let me think from a investor perspective uh if it's if it's a risk you're taking is it fair to say that this kind of a strategy should be done only with a highly diversified portfolio because otherwise with a concentrated position you can end up a risk of a large position not moving for a long period of time or you say that the similar strategy can be done for a for a concentrated portfolio would you do that i mean if you have an option i think a concentrated portfolio of small caps is a risky uh thing to do because uh, firstly there is a if you are managing public money then liquidity is a issue you have to be prepared that at any point of time you can have uh, basically redemptions and especially in a falling market all buyers get out of the market and only compulsive sellers are left so every day we'll be sitting on lower circuit and our own selling will drive our stocks down further and which will induce even more panic in our other investors that every day these stocks are sitting on lower circuit so let me get out before they go to zero so that is the major thing that we want to avoid so we diversify due to that and you see mostly what i have understood that when my confidence was very high in 2018 so there was one company which did a share buyback at 575 rupees and uh, that share buyback was under subscribed promoter did not participate the public also did not participate so then the stock went to 800 then when on its way back when it fell below 575 i thought that now at 575 company had done buyback and today company has got far more cash on the books than last time it did buyback at 575 so it's a and even otherwise valuations were attractive so i thought that it's a low risk uh, i mean uh, another buyback will come for sure and the promoter was honest i, have, I had met him multiple times so there was no issue about the promoter so but the stock went to 300 rupees also 250 rupees also and he didn't do a buyback and every year i used to ask him to do a buyback so he got the impression that i am stuck in his share 
so that is why i am asking him to do a buyback so that i can bail myself out whereas i was telling him to do a open market buyback because it was in the interest of the company so but i mean so on and so forth i mean they are so the bottom line is that that buyback never came at 575 so what i'm trying to say is that nobody really knows how things are going to pan out i mean uh, there was so since in 2017 there was a huge bubble in small cap so i shifted to i sold a lot of small caps and i bought which was a basically it was a net net stock and it had a huge dividend yield and there was every year there was a buyback and i used to go to lugana and ask them to do buyback and uh, the promoters were genuine people everybody knew that and uh, so i thought that this is a good hedge in this kind of a market this is a good hedge at least i'm going to get some 15% uh, come what may then what happened that there was an announcement that the company is going to be merged with the parent company at 300 crore was the cash with the company at 300 crore valuation so i mean you can just get unlucky if you are concentrated and uh, so again we created a lot of hue and cry that this is so unfair and this that so the promoters being genuine people they took back the share buyback but then they stopped paying dividends so a company which was paying on top of buybacks they were paying dividends every year they they were zero dividend for few years so what i understood is that you can never be sure that ki yeah this is a nice promoter and he will so and if you ask the promoter he will say bhai humne to kiya tha buyback hum to kar chuke hai itne buyback to so 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 i have understood the hard way that one can really never be sure i mean you, you can take your chances that if you want to take risk uh, if i put all my money in my top uh, holding so my return would be far higher but then the risk also you can get wiped out also and if you run a concentrated if you have a concentrated portfolio uh, position then it's very hard to be rational and neutral and take a calm decision but if it's a small position then you can take a you can either exit it or scale it up as the case might be so that also is one thing i mean not only is diversification a risk mitigation tool it is also due to the lack of liquidity in small caps and plus if they are similar quality of companies at similar valuations then and nobody really knows the future so why should i take a concentrated bet so it's a mix of all these reasons and also if you see that study after study has proven that a diversified portfolio of even junk bonds outperforms the market diversified portfolio of your cigar butt stocks in terms of price to book value if you make that kind of portfolio even that will beat the market because the company some of them they might go belly up but the others that survive they will give a huge uh, return so now the our effort is to make a diversified portfolio of small cap blue chip companies which are currently going through a down cycle in the business so if i am able to make such a portfolio then i think that portfolio should beat the market consistently and since i don't really know that when exactly is the cycle going to turn in the underlying business so that is why i am taking a small position and as the clarity emerges because once you buy something no matter you might be tracking something but once you buy it you track it more closely so as the things get clearer so then we can scale up that position as we can see the cycle turning so uh, that is the endeavor that uh, we want to make a diversified portfolio of small cap blue chip companies which are going through a down cycle and we call it quality in downturn so basically i want a company which in which the business is intact i don't want a company which is losing market share i want a company which either is gaining market share or market share is maintained it is just that the industry itself is going through a down cycle 
so yeah interesting and that is how your name counter cyclical comes into play i suppose yeah, you can say that basically counter cyclical is that we are not interested in popular stocks we want stocks to become popular after we buy so that we can sell i want to buy something from retail investors and sell to institutional investors i want a company which is not holding on calls and after i buy if it holds i will sell i don't like them these which are what is concall why are you so interested in jacking up your price i mean you just do your own business i am really not a big fan of com- i mean okay should do a concall that's fine but all these small tiny companies which are doing concalls i'm not their fan actually a lot of pressure comes from investors only to do the concall right yeah so basically the promoter is also interested in th- that his stock price should go up and i don't like that those companies in which the promoter is interested that his stock price will go up because then you cannot believe whatever he is saying if a company needs to raise equity capital i will not believe whatever the promoter is saying and we never as a uh, principal we never invest in companies that are uh, they want to raise equity capital because then i mean the promoter will say anything because he wants to raise capital so yeah you know i've been trying to reverse think about the kind of companies which will be there in your portfolio okay and um, uh, actually let me venture a guess and then maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong uh, from what i've heard so far it doesn't seem to me that you are a person who will bet on uh, you know um, what do you call it turn arounds of any sort okay so you are looking for no, businesses no, no. which are, are already are. there just to give you an example and, yeah okay yeah please go ahead please finish your question yeah so yeah so just uh, just to add to that so what i'm thinking is turn around is probably not something you are interested in what you are looking for is established businesses uh established businesses you must be in some way judging from the profitability numbers and the cash flow numbers of the company to start with uh and of course within that you are looking to buy them in the lower cycle so so they will be profitable companies but lower margins at the lower end of the margin cycle is that a fair quantitative profile of the kind of companies you will have no so i'll tell you uh, with a example so let's say there is a company now again this is not a recommendation only for academic purposes we are discussing these names so this company it made a lot of money in 2015 so that was the first time i saw this company that uh, this company is doing well and i went to the agm and that time promoter was very upbeat that 500 crore hamari sale hogi and this that we have plans and this that then w- what had happened in 2015 they basically export 60% of the egg powder from india and you, they export to japan europe etc and their main competitor is us so the thing is that in uh, us in 2015 there was some bird flu or something due to which egg prices had shot up and that's how this guy made a lot of money and thereafter the company stopped making money matlab it was almost as if no profit no loss then in 2018 then so uh, every year i used to go to their agm and the promoter used to say no no, no it will recover and this that abhi it de stocking chal raha hai uh it will come back and so on then in 2018 he, the promoter was in depression that nothing is happening we are alive due to rupee depreciation otherwise we won't be alive because in india the demand for eggs is buoyant whereas us may it's a saturated market and plus in us a gm soya corn is available which is cheaper and in india it's not uh, available so your feed is only more expensive so basically we are uncompetitive only rupee depreciation is keeping us alive so i sold it at a good loss then last year i read somewhere that um, in us uh, inflation the break up of inflation was given and the egg prices had the highest inflation in us so then it clicked me that okay that company again it will make money because the prices have of eggs have gone up in us so i uh, checked some more and then we built it uh, was for some time our top pos- five positions so so uh, so it was a turn round only if you say matlab from hardly no profit no loss now this company in one quarter it is making more profit than last five years combined so yeah so cyclical companies we like 
and especially the ones that i have seen in the past and i understand the business so i can join the dots Stoic Talks has been partnered by DSP Mutual Fund which was an obvious choice for us having interacted with the DSP team earlier and recognizing how they are obsessed with helping investors take better decisions some examples of their motivation to help investors do better are visible in their research related work which they make available for free including getting smarter tatya report card their invest for good blog among others and many more reports we thank team DSP for supporting this episode of Stoic Talks and recommend that you follow them on twitter their handle is at @dspmf so there is one saying about you from your friends that you uh, hate uh, expensive businesses hate quality businesses uh, love uh, and you are an encyclopedia of small cap companies so how true is your hate for uh, quality companies no it's not quality whenever or expensive companies now, there is one company which makes let's say so whenever you hear that this is a b2c business and they are selling in us and the competitor so that is the time to sell this stock and whenever you hear that promoters are crook that is the time to buy this company but the fact is that both are true now how big a crook that's a uh, something that actually that's the problematic part because you don't really know look business is genuine that's not the issue the again the thing is capital allocation and the greed of the promoter so a greedy promoter you don't know what he will do next so i had bought again in 2018 uh, due to overconfidence there was there is a company which has got 50% market share on boric asset and i knew this i was tracking this company since a long time and i knew that the promoter is a crook i had met him in the agm and he's a very soft spoken person even if you go and abuse him on his face he will just smile so but the stock was very cheap and they had huge cash balance and i got a impression that the corporate governance is on the mend so this company had diversified into real estate and made investments in real estate then uh, the promoter told me that no, no henceforth we will not do anything no more real estate investments and this that and i every year i used to ask him to do buyback and i had 3% equity in this company in my own family's name in 2018 then in 20 so every year i used to ask him for a share buyback and he used to say yeah yeah we'll consider we'll consider we are considering and then on 15th march of 2020 announcement came that they have bought a 42 crore worth of flat in pali hills 5 bhk where the now the promoter must be staying with his family so i made a loss of over 1 crore in that company itself and then to rub salt on my wounds that stock went up 10 times in the next one one and a half years due to it was chemical chemical so chemical very good prospect chemical store i mean what chemical when the promoter yeah chemical promoter will become rich from chemicals shareholders nothing will happen to them so that's the problem in companies where there are corporate governance even if the business is real if the promoter is a crook and is if he is a greedy person you don't really know that tomorrow what will he do i mean till the time i had bought he had only bought luxury cars auditor was his wife's relative and what else he he had bought real estate and used to draw humongous salaries whereas the dividend was flat till since 2007 at 1.5 rupees and after he bought 42 crore flat then the dividend was increased to 10 rupees <laughs> so uh, there are many such interesting cases and uh, say because i have tagged the line called chor bane more uh, when it was uh, 2015 exactly. and by end of it it became an investment strategy but that is the fact in indian companies there is always uh, 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 namak mein dal hai ya dal mein namak hai nahi samajhta but uh, so tell us some cases where you actually saw things change right say you've gone through an agm for 10 years and did you see some change and because of that you ended up making a lot of money or some cases which were very interesting 
no so let's focus on cases where i lost money so there is this company they have cello brand so this company i had bought in 2010 and it was at single digit p and uh, i had gone to daman and i had met the promoter and everything and at that time they had just one leased one leased plant in daman with two second hand machines and one plant in batti for bubble guard now then i sold this stock in 2015 at some 50 pe or something like that 2015 or 16 there about then again when the stock started falling it made a high of some 1500 1600 1700 rupees or there about then i when it fell below 700 again i went to the agm and the promoter was full of ki humne test bin launch kiya hai 150 200 crore to yahi se sale a jayegi 2 saal mein aur ye ho jayega wo ho jayega he was totally upbeat and i thought that i knew this company and this promoter is good because by that time this must be like 2018 from two plants they had already gone to nine plants and company was totally debt free so from its own internal accruals company had grown the business so i had very high regard for this company and i thought this that, that this is a high quality company and their margins were always superior than the competition throughout then so i thought this is a temporary issue and the promoter also said ki gst mein pehle 28% rate tha to iski wajah se ye ho gaya wo ho gaya aur ab ye sab resolve ho gaya so every year he had a valid issue a valid excuse so i thought ki okay i should give him time so stock kept on falling i kept on uh, averaging out and then cash had accumulated in the balance sheet of around 200 crore or there about so every year i was asking for a share buyback so finally what happened and meanwhile the promoter share holding fell from 75 to 55% so some people got declassified as promoter then finally last year or this year earlier this year notice came that promoter wants to give 100 crore loan to promoter group and 100 crore guarantee so that was the time i sold this company but i still don't know that what would i have done differently i don't know i could have just so i had at peak i had 3% weightage of this company because i genuinely believe that it's a high quality company and if you look at just numbers and everything and if you, if you separate cash then actually it's a very high return on capital when it's a branded business so but then the if the promoter only out of nowhere if he is and now it seems that it was all planned i mean uh, the promoters that were declassified and that resolution special resolution to loan the monies to the promoter group it barely passed i mean just by a whisker it passed so because those people who were declassified as promoters they voted in favor had otherwise they couldn't have voted had they been uh, had they remained as promoters so that resolution won't have passed so the promoter was had plans to basically please the shareholders but i mean there was i don't know what i could have done differently uh, so that's why i have realized that uh, it's best to run a diversified portfolio so that uh, i mean these things can be taken care of yeah actually i was about to ask that only so from did i hear it correctly you said your maximum position in this stock was 3% yeah okay so uh so when you said 3% and you kept on buying as the stock fell uh is there by default i mean of course you run a very diversified portfolio that by default makes that you will not have enough cash uh you know to keep on buying because you have so many stocks Uh, we are fully invested fully invested right so so generally when you are buying you probably will be selling something to buy something uh, yes. that will be one of the so that in inherently there is a hedge that you need to sell something to buy something so by default you would probably not be selling a lot of ideas so not uh, buying a lot of a uh, particular stock uh, do you by any chance have a maximum also that okay i don't want to go beyond 5% in any name whatsoever uh, given no, that you want not saying uh, like that again 2016 i uh, took a concentrated portfolio that time it was only my family portfolio but i bought 26% in because i had attended the agm and i had sat with the promoter for 2 hours and he was gracious enough to explain the business in detail and i saw that there were simple people 
I mean, you look at their office, you look at the cars that they were using, and they really in drum closure business had that business had it been a standalone business, that business alone would be more than the market cap. And then finally, I asked them to do a share buyback, and actually they did also. They made a, after that I started buying because the stock was in two uh, hundred rupees. Buyback had already been announced at two seventy rupees, so it was a kind of arbitrage thing that I thought that twenty percent of my shares will uh, approximately fifteen twenty percent of my shares will go in the buyback, and for the rest, I mean it was good risk. So yeah, so if that kind of a arbitrage kind of a situation is there or if i'm confident about the promoters that at least they are genuine people and the business is also solid and if it is available at a good valuation then i'm happy to take a uh, reasonably concentrated i'm now concentrated is also relative it can not be 26% of portfolio but maybe it can be like 5% or it can even be 10% but it's actually case to case that what is the trigger and how soon is the trigger now this so it's not a great corporate governance story it is just that there was a immediate trigger so okay so uh, 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 in the last 3 years what's the maximum you have seen in terms of allocation in a particular stock just to gauge from the 12%. time you're managing public money 12% it went because we didn't put 12% okay since the stock went up that's why uh, sure. at a cost at a cost level uh, cost level happen difficult to oh, that's fine yeah yeah i understand okay uh, you know one one thing which has come up again and again and again in our conversation is that you are very value focused one thing which is uh, very clear can you give some perspective on how you go about see again i understand valuation is a very common sensical you know common sensical exercise and not a mathematical exercise so to speak but when you are having a view on valuation then you want to be very conscious how do you go about you can take some examples and you know uh, give us an idea about how you think about valuations and add on question to that is when valuation starts to go berserk uh, not for allocation because you don't seem to care about allocation too much i think it's more about your valuation which becomes uncomfortable which might leads to selling is that a fair understanding are you selling only because of valuations or something else yeah we are we basically we are early to the party and we leave early i don't want to participate in the last lap i want to sell my cyclical stocks when the sun is shining i want to get out at 12 pm mujhe 3 baje tak i don't want to wait i exit early and i enter early and because after a while it is just speculation that uh, i mean once it is beyond your valuation comfort and it is just momentum like let's say defense stocks now so just the momentum is taking up taking uh, is increasing those stocks so now i have no way to figure out that uh, i mean i have sold stocks uh, late last year and they have doubled i am talking about defense stock so but that time also the what i was buying i thought uh, that uh, the switch made sense i mean fundamentally speaking and uh, but of course yeah i mean uh, with the hindsight i mean nobody knew that this kind of a uh, uh, defense uh, bubble or whatever you want to call it uh, that's going to happen so yeah so as soon as if i can find something better i'll just sell and move on because so, so can, otherwise so can, you, can yeah. you pick out some of the good names which you already mentioned or maybe some more names where with some perspective on numbers how are you evaluating it on the valuation front and what kind of valuations you are absolutely comfortable with just a broad idea would say taking an older example where you say bought at xp sold at yp or say how did you go about the whole cycle of buying and selling a company you know the question is to give you know the listeners an idea about a quick hand analysis on the valuation front or uh, with some examples if it's possible so let's say that uh, firstly i will only give weightage to cash or mostly cash if the promoter is genuine if the promoter is not genuine then uh, there is no cash and even if the promoter is genuine you need to take out a quarter of the cash uh, because if the even if the company does buy back in the best case scenario that's 
or to go to the government so what i basically in a cyclical stock what i look for is that what were the previous peak earnings i mean it is true that it's not necessary that let's say in the next upturn it's not necessary that i will again make the kind of money that it made few years back you see it depends upon cycle to cycle but still if a company has made that much money in the past okay in the past cycle so i can take it as a benchmark i mean one has to really adjust it like i already said that it's not this graphite and they will again do that much but let's say for example uh, or for that matter any cyclical stock so it's like saying if a runner if he has already if he has completed that race or uh, that track in a given time so that he has already done it in the past so he can do it again it's it's in the realm of possibility so that is i mean to begin with that is what i look that i mean let's say any stock let's say like chemicals are in a downturn now okay so if you want to take so look at its peak ebitda and compare it with the market cap that is it if in some subsequent year down the line the company will surpass its previous first the question is whether it will or not i mean if it is it if it was a cycle like if you see uh, post covid the kind of money the ship liners made i mean uh, god knows when they will again make that kind of money i mean it's no, i'm not asking you to take that as a benchmark and value those companies but i'm the problem in stock market is that everything is on a case by case basis there is no generalized this thing that i can give but what i try to see if the promoter is genuine i look at ev to cash flow yield i look at ev to operating cash flow and that is my basic uh, yardstick but that i will only take now i have uh, made a lot of losses that if you buy shares of crooks and th- those who have got a lot of money in the balance sheet and you minus that from the market cap and then if you see it's trading at one two time ev a bit or even uh, five time cash flow but that cash is going to vanish one day so there is this company uh, again bhavnagar based company mr we had met him he is very small soft spoken gentleman and he had work in precision cast parts during in us during his internship days which subsequently buffett bought and so on and he was a i mean if you talk to him you the the feeling i had that this company and if you look at the company's numbers so they used to make over 30% margin and their realization per gram and this and that so business was high quality and uh, again i used to ask them to do a share buyback instead what happened that uh, they acquired two paper companies of the promoters and they had no assets whatsoever and on ev basis they paid something i think all together they paid some 40 crore or thereabouts because the companies that they acquired they had debt also so basically all the cash vanished and i still don't know what i would have done differently because the promoter was genuine you look at his track record look at the numbers of the company everything was above board there was no problem so how do you know tomorrow what promoter is going to do and at least in the case of that boric acid company i knew since the beginning that this promoter is a crook and but i thought the corporate governance is on the mend or at least the promoter was telling me that no more real estate investment but here i mean to begin with the promoter was a genuine person if you speak to him and there was nothing to suggest that uh, hanky panky is going on because there was there was no hanky panky before this event so basically the more i have seen the market the more i have realized that things are basically unpredictable you can basically take your chances you can run a concentrated portfolio and you can get lucky or you can get unlucky but really i have not been able to understand till now that what i could have done differently in uh let's say except for maybe a smaller position it's very interesting to see that you've spoken about all your uh, 
say places where you've lost and the fact is over the last 3 years you've uh, made a killing across the board even with a diversified portfolio say the returns have been crazier than one could think uh, so that is i think is your focus in terms of minimizing your mistakes uh, uh, instead of uh, glorifying what you made out of uh, a lot of these small caps because all through this discussion we are only hearing about where you screwed up and not the place where you made uh, 10 20 50 waggers that that's what make it a very good learning session for all of us actually so so uh, actually one very interesting thing which i found is very rarely i have seen pmss doing this kind of a diversified work because a lot of uh, what do you say a pitch is superior stock selection and not superior you know returns coming from superior stock stock selection where you, whereas your way is very different which is i don't know which one is going to do well but i know these are good companies let me have all these companies and let's wait for them to do their job uh, yeah nobody could have i mean loan let's take a company like some years uh, quite a few years back they sold a huge land parcel their personal factory and so on they got a huge amount and from that money the promoter was buying a c facing flat and all that company was buying and with the promoter will live so i mean uh, i just stopped tracking that company then and there but then subsequently returns have come in that company also so it's very hard to say that i mean so that's why i have learned that i can take a small i'll never buy a large position in such kind of company in which i know the promoter is he's a greedy person so let's say that uh, i want i can take a large position in companies in which the promoter is a genuine person and basically he is even then one cannot be sure because if someone can point out to me that what was what annual report you read and what was he doing what hanky panky there was no related party nothing was there i think the so, same company you are talking about is in news for something else uh, in the recent times Uh, I don't know. I no, think you should I go and check. It is a very funny incident which has happened in that company now. Okay, I'll I, I, I'll check. I it don't want it. to talk about it, so we'll keep it off record. Yeah, but all these companies. Uh-huh. Th- this is just my opinion. I might be wrong. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Companies promoter might be uh, the greatest person in the world. It is just that I have made a loss, so maybe I am crying. Uh, maybe I am cursing them, but. please uh, i'm not blaming anyone they they are all my mistakes and i'm solely responsible so i'm not okay so, so there is a official disclaimer it. for all the listeners that all these are for education purposes only yeah, and yeah, yeah. so any examples where you got lucky where you thought this could not happen and this happened no many times you get lucky i mean uh, many times bull markets uh, bail you out i had bought a company in i think 2017 when again i went that company used to lay lay down pipelines and that was a good well run company at least the numbers uh, one could uh, understand and uh, its current liabilities used to fund its current assets so there was not much uh, capital of the company that was deployed so i went to delhi i met the promoters and i got a very bad feeling after meeting them and uh, but still i was holding because 2017 everything was expensive then what happened the revenues of this company started falling and twice a year the balance sheet comes so when the next balance sheet came the receivables were more than the revenues of past 6 months so i thought that i am now basically uh, i am stuck over here and i'm god god knows after i saw those results i thought that i don't know at what price i'll be able to sell but i will sell at any price so because anyway i was uh, matlab not uh, i was disenchanted with the promoters because they had diversified into clutch plate and all that bullshit uh, so anyhow but instead i sold it at a profit because it was 2017 and there was a huge uh, bull market so i don't want to name the investor who bailed me out i read in the blog deal but yeah so i got lucky i was 
thinking that i i don't know at what price the stock was at around 2 for a uh, 140 rupees i had uh, come to terms that it will go i will take it down to double digits and uh, but i exited at a profit because somebody did not really see the numbers properly and uh, so i'm I, I actually you know again while you're saying some questions are coming to mind but one question which i generally ask everybody is that and in your case makes a bit more of a case is that let's say 2017 market you are in an overvalued uh, from your vantage point it will be even more overvalued than you're comfortable with uh why not cash i mean why not you consider moving to cash from because the alternate positions are kachra or something which you might not be very comfortable with from quality perspective is there a view point there or is it a conscious decision of never to go in cash uh, any views so i will that? never say never i think in a market like 2007 i will come to cash if there is nothing to else to buy and i'll return the money to my investors but other, otherwise i'll shift to large caps maybe ps something okay. like that but i will exit small caps if there is every 10 years there is a bubble in small caps on an average and whenever that happens next time and this time i have resolved not to buy cheap stocks at the top of the uh, uh, bull market i want to at least buy decent companies in which the business is growing and at least there should be comfort i can so that i can sleep well that while i'm sleeping the business is growing that should be the feeling not that while i'm sleeping someone is stealing from my pocket so uh, say from your uh, observations over the years you've had a concentrated portfolio diversified portfolio uh, does diversification help on the downside in a market cycle really because everything falls right we've seen in various cycles or is it the comfort you get from diversification that all right will be at least able to sell look it's it's a mix of both in running a diversified port firstly it's a, it makes the life of the fund management team far harder if you have 10 stocks then you just need to follow 10 stocks and rest you can do marketing you can write newsletters and so on and so forth but if you have 100 shares then you have to keep on tracking those 100 shares so it's a very difficult a relatively more difficult thing to do but then since it i don't take it as a job i it's my hobby and passion so it it i don't take it as a work so it's my hobby that's why i do it now the thing is the flexibility is that if let's say i have got company a and company b i have made 1% allocation in both so what does that mean that means by and large i think both are of similar quality and similar valuation that's why i have put the same weightage right otherwise if i felt that company a is of higher quality and similar valuation then why would i have kept the weightage same now similar quality similar valuation you can still say but similar quality it's a subjective thing you see i mean what is similar quality so but by and large i mean just for from my own this thing i'm saying so now let's say that there is no fundamental change happening everything else remaining the same no new information it's just a bull market company a is up uh, 20% and company b is up 50% uh, without any new development so i can sell company b which is up 50% and increase my allocation in company a right and let's say in a falling market again no new development it's just that company a is down 20% company b is down 50% so i can sell company a and increase my allocation in company b so that flexibility is there with me but if i have already to begin with if, if i have got 10% uh, weightage then how much further can i take that weightage i mean at some point of time it uh, basically it, it it it's a leap of faith and it's not prudent to do that because i mean all the cases that i have cited in which i really don't know what i could have done differently then to buy a maybe smaller uh, weightage smaller than that 
<laughs> that would have been a no, difficult I, thing to do. Of 3%, I could have bought 1%. I mean, and that too with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, I mean, benefit, but sure. actually I made that 3% weightage because I thought that it's a, it's a blue chip company. It's a branded consumer, high quality company. And uh, I know the business and that it's in a downturn. But who knew that the promoter will do this kind of a thing of which there was no previous, it was out of the blue. So if you look at, it was out of the blue. What promoter might do tomorrow, who knows? So uh, interesting is that, say, uh, say, when you talk about these names, you have such a lot of diversification. One thing we were very clear that you buy cheap, right? So what is the thumb rule you have for the upside? Okay, this is what I would not like to pay, say EV by a beta or some number where you say, okay, now this goes beyond my uh, radar. What sort of valuations or say change in valuations, etc. I mean, you see, it's relative. It's hard to give a clear cut. Mostly I try to buy companies that have got good market share, even though they are small cap they have good market share and they are not losing that market share and that like i said i try to see what how much the company has made in a normal good year okay not a exceptional year like let's say the few years back so that i can since you see in a cyclical downturn earnings for more or less they just evaporate they are hardly any earnings right if you look at chemical stocks and dyes and pigments and so on at this time either companies are making losses or they are making minuscule profits so how do you i mean only way to figure that out is to see that in a one full year of what was the peak earnings that the company made before and whether the company and how far the prices of the underlying commodity have fallen since you see and whether is there any likelihood that those prices will come back again uh, i'm talking about the underlying commodity and if so then on a higher base because most companies uh, keep on expanding capacity so then on the higher base uh, when can this company surpass its previous so basically the stock should be at a bargain to its earlier uh, earning capacity you see it should be cheap if we assume its previous earnings you see so if you j- j- just if you take that all these your underwear manufacturers i'm not talking about uh, the next three if you comp- their fy23 earnings are uh they have just evaporated margins have been slashed and so on uh, volumes have also gone down so now but if you you can take their fy22 numbers that when you feel that they will be able to what is how does the market cap look if we compare it with fy22 numbers okay that is a starting point then the question is how soon can these companies come back or surpass their previous peak earnings but what i want to see is that this much company has made in the past okay i mean if it is due to exceptional circumstances then uh, like i said it's very hard to give a uh, one size fits all answer because all these things are case to case if the prices of the underlying commodity are not going to reach anywhere near uh, the levels uh, of the past then i mean all this is in vain just to just to get some rough idea keshav uh, 2018 onwards we saw a big crash in small cap you know small cap names i mean the whole index was down some 50% if i remember correctly small cap index bse small cap uh wh- since you are 100% invested and you have always been 100% invested the kind of portfolio do you construct what kind of drawdowns you saw in your portfolios broadly again not a exact number but when wh- in 2018 18 to Yeah, so crash. that time there was no PMS. So uh, from my family portfolio fell from peak of fifty five in Jan eighteen to twenty four in March twenty twenty. Okay, so pretty much in line. What, what I'm trying, why I'm trying to ans- ask this question is because 
uh, from pretty much what Nuresh asked earlier also that whether this kind of a diversified but good quality small cap portfolio does it provide a it was hedge not, on the downside at not, all or not? Neither was it good quality <laughs> nor was it diversified. Achha, you okay? Two thousand eighteen was slightly more concentrated. And uh, uh, say now you are running this portfolio at a particular size, your AUM right now, right? Where do you think? it becomes a cap your strategy or your planning say going forward you're ready to change with the kind of say today you have so i've seen like say you have uh, some company which is like 20 crores market cap also in that portfolio and there are companies which are much much higher this thing and overall your aum etc so do you think there's a cap to your strategy of buying into small caps okay, okay this is a cap where i would say i don't want any new money I mean, yeah, if the, I think that will primarily depend upon the valuations, uh, not on the size of the AUM because until and unless, uh, I'm able to find like even 2000, 3000, 5000, even 10,000 crore market cap companies provide they, they, something should be available at a good price, but if nothing is available, then even a small amount of money. And in any case, you see whatever money we are managing it's fully deployed right so the question is only of the incremental money that i have to deploy it is not though that every day i have to invest all this 375 crore it is just maybe 50 lakhs uh, every day or something like that that i need to find a place to deploy right makes sense makes sense but anyways keshav it was a, a very different kind of conversation than usual a very different style to be honest but uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of people will take a lot of interesting learning, especially when it comes to small cap, mid cap. And I mean, amazingly, uh, when you when you talked about the importance of the diversification, because majority of the PMS focus on the other side of things. So it, it uh, will be very insightful for a lot of listeners. At least for me, there were some really interesting takeaways, which I'll keep to myself for now and uh, mention later in the blog, probably. Uh, but thanks for your time, Keshav. It was really good talking to you. Nuresh, if you have any questions, uh, otherwise I would, uh, I have, I, we've already taken a lot of time from Keshav. Yeah, so we would just, I would just like to thank you. And it's interesting to see different perspectives of uh, way at looking. Say, uh, there are few people who go the AGM way like you do. You go small caps, micro caps, so that it helps uh, learners. Uh, there's not single way to make money. There are hundreds of ways. And yours was one more interesting one for our listeners. Thanks a lot for uh, the time. Thanks, Nuresh. The pleasure is mine. Thank you very much. And once again, please, uh, this discussion was for academic purposes. None of the companies that I have named, uh, am, I, uh, am I alleging anything on the part of the promoters? I think they are all good people and things should be seen in context. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time, Keshav. Thank Thanks. you. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.